This is the crash course in teaching diagnostic reasoning. This is part five, diagnostic schema. A diagnostic schema becomes so popular for teaching clinical reasoning, and there's a very good reason, and we'll see that here. So let's start with a case. Sorry, I'm an intensivist. I'm going to give you an intensive care unit case. A 56-year-old man with a history of alcohol abuse, chronic hepatitis C with fibrosis, and stage four chronic kidney disease presents to the intensive care unit after being found down by a friend. He's diagnosed with pneumonia that quickly progresses to septic shock. Klebsiella pneumonia is ultimately recovered from the sputum and blood cultures. During the first three days of his ICU course, he also has marked elevations in his AST, ALT, and total bilirubin, which peaked on day one and now are downtrending. On admission, his platelet count was already a little bit low, 106,000, and on hospital day three, it is now 36,000. And you're going to ask me, why is he thrombocytopenic? I get this all the time in the ICU, and this kills me, right? There's so many reasons this guy could be thrombocytopenic. So I need an approach. I need a standardized way to work this up. Now, here's one approach. This is complicated, uh, and I don't like this because this doesn't map very well to the mechanisms that I have in my brain. This comes from the uh, American Society of Hematology Education book, um, and I put it up here because this, to me, is not a good scheme. This is a, an algorithm, but it doesn't really map to a scheme. Now, again, I don't have to use a scheme. I might use other ways to try to solve this problem. Why is he thrown by cytopenic? Well, should I use problem representation? I've kind of already done problem representation here, and there's still not an intuitive answer. Should I use an illness script? When I try to use an illness script and I give this to fellows, they just say septic because the illness script for sepsis is so prominent here and that's going to be the most convenient explanation for the thrombocytopenia. But I'm a, I'm a good doctor. I don't want to miss things. So maybe I should have an approach or a scheme. A scheme is just a simplified approach to a common problem. Here's my scheme for thrombocytopenia. This is something I probably stole from somebody else. I'm sure I did. And I know a lot of people are using a very similar scheme. Thrombocytopenia usually is one of three mechanisms. Destruction, consumption, impaired production or sequestration. One of my colleagues throws in dilution and that's fine. You want to throw that in there? That's okay. But generally, these are the three major causes of thrombocytopenia. And under each of these major umbrellas or buckets, I can start to think of specific causes, right? So if I want to just think about destruction and consumption, well, in this patient, I might think about DIC or the sepsis or it might be drug mediated or the patient has hit. If I'm thinking about impaired production, well, I have another set of explanations, right? I can think it's sepsis, alcohol-related myel alcohol myelosuppression, medications, nutritional deficiencies, underlying myelodysplasia, whatever. Might he have sequestration? Sure, he could. If he actually has underlying cirrhosis and not fibrosis. Or if he has some acute alcoholic hepatitis and some degree of portal hypertension, maybe there's, the, the spleen's a little bit enlarged and there's some sequestration. So here's some examples of my schema that I use all the time. If I see someone in shock, I'm wondering, are they hypovolemic, cardiogenic, dis and distributive, or an obstructive shock? If I see somebody who I think has an infection that's not getting better on antibiotics, here's my scheme for antibiotic failure. Is it the wrong bud, bug? Is it the wrong drug? Or do I have the wrong diagnosis? When I used to do outpatient medicine, I had one approach to anemia, which is microcytic, normocytic versus macrocytic. Now I only see acute inpatients, so I have a different approach. If their anemia is worsening in the hospital, it's either blood loss, hemolysis, myelosuppression, or dilution. Those are the major mechanisms why patients' anemia gets worse in the hospital. Now there's a reason we all love schema. There's a good science behind it, right? If I have a problem like thrombocytopenia that has 100 different causes, I need an approach. I can't think of 100 th different things in my working memory. I can only think of seven or so. And my working memory can only hold so much. And if there's not an immediate intuitive solution to my problem, I need to think of some way to organize my thoughts around thrombocytopenia. And there, I'm going to use some system two thinking, right? It's going to be a little analytical, a little effortful, but I'm going to be able to pick an approach that I can start to simplify the problem and work through different arms of that problem and allow my working memory to handle what it can handle, right? So if I have thrombocytopenia and I break it down into one of three major mechanisms, when under each of those mechanisms, I can start to think of five, six, seven different causes of destruction, five, six, seven different causes of impaired production. And there I might be able to arrive ultimately at an intuitive or efficient solution. I've, in using a scheme, I've freed up my intrinsic load of the task. I don't have to think of 100 different things. I have a very simple set of buckets under which thrombocytopenia causes exist. And now I have some germane load to think about how I'm thinking, learn a little bit more. Now, ultimately, I'm probably going to combine system one and system two reasoning. I'm going to use my working memory, and I'm going to pick one arm of my scheme. And I'm going to work through it, right? Destruction, consumption. Well, from there, I can start to pick different reasoning strategies to work through the different di diagnostic possibilities. If I thought DIC was present, I might look for evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. If I thought a medication was causing it, I'd have to look this up a little bit, but I can start looking at a medication list. If I thought there was HIT, I could use a different way of reasoning, which is to use a validated score, some Bayesian probabilistic reasoning here, right? I could complete some sort of risk scoring to determine whether HIT was even realistic possibility or not. 
And finally, I might start to use illness scripts, right? So one of the things that came up was TTP is a cause of destruction and consumption. Well, I might start to look at this patient's case and say, does this fit with the illness script for TTP? So by using scheme, I've freed up some of my brain power to use other types of reasoning to solve the case. So let's look at another integrated case as an example. Elderly man with acute kidney injury. Now, even early clinical learners know a good scheme for acute kidney injury. They know it's pre-renal, intrarenal, or post-renal. Now, they may not remember all the causes under each of this, but this is where you can prompt them, right? And you'd say, well, pre-renal is hypovolemia, decreased effective circulating volume. Intrarenal is ischemia, glomerulonephritis, or some sort of toxin-induced injury, like a drug-induced injury. And as you can see, these are actually almost scheme, uh, schema within a scheme, right? So there are sort of a sub-scheme or sub-layer to each of these. It's like peeling of an onion back, right? And again, using I, my scheme as my scaffold, I can start to use other types of reasoning, right? So if we are thinking, could this be pre-renal, we can start to use illness scripts and look for elements of an illness script for pre-renal acute kidney injury, hypovolemic illness script, poor oral intake, recent GI upset, patients on diuretics. If I have a suspect intrarenal injury, again, I can start using other types of reasoning strategies. I look for supporting data. I might use, um, you know, by easy and probabilistic reasoning and say, okay, we think this might be pre-renal. How well does the FE or rea greater than 35% affect my probability of intrarenal disease in this case? Now, the patient might actually have some pivotal finding. And I'm like, hold on a second. You just told me that he dumped 1,200 mLs of urine when they placed the Foley catheter in the ER. I can start to use that pivotal finding or that pivot point, which is a form of problem representation that is going to help me solve uh, this acute kidney injury case because now that's sort of in my post-renal arm of the scheme. And when I'm in the post-renal arm of the scheme, I would again start to invoke the sub-schema, right? And the sub-scheme for post-renal is anatomic versus functional. Again, this is sort of moving down the approach. I am already in the post-renal arm, so I've already freed up all of my memory I'm not having to worry about this task anymore, separating the types of acute kidney injury. I've solved what kind of acute kidney injury it is, and now I have more brain power, more working memory to work through the possible causes of post-renal injury. Is it anatomic? Is it a functional? So then I can work through the anatomic causes, and I can work through the functional causes. BPH in the anatomic arm, anticholinergic drugs, neurogenic bladder in the functional arm. So why should we encourage our learners to use schema? Because they are principled approaches not random associations or mnemonics. They are physiologically sound, they are anatomically sound, or they're mechanistic, right? So this is not just memorizing a bunch of random associations, but there's a mechanism to these, a lot of these disease processes and there's a lot of these common complaints we see. And if you have a mechanistic approach, you are going to be able to reduce your intrinsic cognitive load. It's a way of thinking about the problem more efficiently. Further, schema can function as a mental checklist to avoid missing things. So when I see the thrombocytopenic patient in the ICU, I will quickly run through my scheme just to make sure I'm not missing any of the other uh, arms of the, of the uh, diagnostic approach. And finally, as we've shown in a couple of cases here, they trigger other types of reasoning. So once I've figured out where I am in the scheme, I can start to use other types of reasoning to solve the case. Finally, schema begets schema. So this is, again, uh, underlying the concept that once you're in a different arm of uh, one arm of a scheme, you can start to think about the subarms within that that would help you further delineate the causes of, of the patient's disease or complaint. So how should you teach schema? I'm actually not sure. Again, teaching diagnostic reasoning, there's no right way to do it, right? I think, though, it's important to recognize that having a standard approach is helpful, right? So if you have standard approaches to common problems you see, you already have schema that you can teach. You're probably doing this already. You just need to articulate it. You need to let your learners know that this is a great way to solve clinical problems, having a standard approach. Now, your schema may work for you, but they may not work for everyone. So, for example, I have a scheme for altered mental status that works for me. I think about the pathophysiologic processes that lead to impaired brain function. Not enough glucose, not enough, not enough oxygen, impaired uh, mechanisms of uh, neurotransmission demyelination. And then from there, I can start to think about all the other different causes that lead to those major mechanisms. Why is there not enough glucose? Why is there not enough oxygen? Is it a blood flow problem? Is it a hypoxemia problem? Why are the cell membranes behaving in a funny way? Why are neuron pulses not being transmitted? Is it because of an electrolyte problem? Is it a toxin? Is it something in interfering with the GABA or the glut uh, glutamine or whatever the neurotransmitters are in the brain, right? So that's my scheme for altered mental status, but it may not be everybody else's scheme. So just recognize what works for you may not work for everyone, but that doesn't mean you should not encourage learners to use these. In fact, I would encourage 
learners to search for ways to simplify common problems into major buckets or categories, particularly for the things that they're going to see all the time. It's going to free up cognitive load, and it's going to be a much better way to remember ways to organize their thoughts and diagnostic reasoning than something like a mnemonic.